Chris Weber joins the podcast today, a global executive and corporate vice president at Microsoft. With over 20 years of experience at Microsoft, Chris has been in sales and marketing for both enterprise and partner groups in the United States. In his current role, he leads the commercial growth organization, which included business strategy and sales across commercial customer segments. Prior to that, he was at Nokia as the executive vice president responsible for global sales and marketing of their feature and smartphone business, representing over 4,000 employees. Chris is an exceptional people leader, culture impactor, and business executive. He is known for thriving the best on energy from empowering the people, communities, businesses that he represents to achieve more. I've had the opportunity to witness Chris's leadership style being a part of the organization. And I've asked him to come on to share his journey, to share a little bit about his leadership principles. And for those of you that are watching, what are some of the key things you can walk away to hone in on your own craft? Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I appreciate it. It's great to be here with you. I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I love starting off with the early days. You know, you've had a tremendous journey. Uh, you've carried some really senior roles responsible for large organizations and large teams. But I'd love for you to share with me like the early days. How did it all start and bring you to where you are today? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think what you basically said is, hey, you're really old. You got a lot of experience there, <laughs> uh, which is an accurate statement. And, you know, as I said before, I haven't found anything good about getting old other than you do get some wisdom and knowledge that you didn't have when you were younger. But uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, you know, I think, again, my, my career, I think, in some respects has been defined as much about failure as success. And so, you know, I like to say, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, you can recover from these things. But I also think there's incredible learning from both success, but also failure. And, you know, as I tell my kids all the time, failure is not fatal. Like, learn from it and grow. And, you know, I think you can look at a lot of execs and you might focus on the success side of things, but there's certainly uh, probably embedded failures in almost uh, all of them. But, you know, my, my career started, you know, I grew up in Ohio and then started out of college at a company called CompuServe. You're probably too young to even know who they are. Um, that was pre-internet days. Uh, and then came to Microsoft. And then after about 16 years, went over to Nokia, ran a failed phone business we'll talk about because there were some of the greatest lessons learned from leadership, business strategy, all those things at Nokia. The failure was so big, Microsoft acquired Nokia uh, and I came back into Microsoft uh, through that Nokia acquisition and now I've been back about six years. So I've been at Microsoft about 22 years. So most of my career, uh, I'm a Microsofty through and through. So you, I love that you really emphasize the element of failure there as it pertained to your trajectory as a leader in terms of how you've continued on that journey, right? What would you say were some of the key things to deal with the failure, number one, but number two, how did you, how did you apply that consistently as you encountered more and more and more failure along the way? Yeah, I think the thing I, I've said before is like the four years I was at Nokia, which, you know, you could define certainly as a failure. I mean, the phone business struggled immensely, but I learned more in those four years than I learned in the previous 16 years of success at Microsoft. And, you know, the way just all up and we can talk about it more, the way I define leadership is around four categories, uh, strategy, operations, customer and people. And that's in no particular order, but what I would tell any leader or person striving to be in leadership, that people component is the single most important one. Like if you don't hire the right people, doesn't matter how good you are on strategy, ops, uh, customer, et cetera, you gotta be able to, to build great talent. But if you look across those things, like the failure at Nokia, it was everything from our strategy. I mean, trying to get in too early in the US versus creating a niche outside the US, which we were doing from a volume perspective, but we were enamored with the high-end smartphone in the U.S. and we went right into, you know, Apple's territory there. And so you just think from a strategy perspective, there's things that could have been done differently. The way you prioritize your OPEX in a crisis is probably different. Boy, did I learn some things there, particularly in large companies. There's a ton of fat in companies that you think is driving something in the marketplace. And there's a lot of them that they're just sort of empty strings uh, in the marketplace. And then how do you recruit and attract and retain talent when you're on a downward curve? 
And how do you do it in an authentic way? Because you got to get people to believe that the company can turn around, you can be successful, et cetera. And that was probably the single hardest thing was how do you wake up every day enthused yourself, but get the masses on your team excited and energized to say, hey, we're going to take the hill when the odds are dramatically against you. Uh, and so just all those learnings um, and challenge on how you overcome that. Again, those four years, I would never uh, trade those in in a million years because I think I'm a better leader today uh, having that experience. And then the last thing, you know, at the end of the day, I talk a lot about, and this is again, probably because I'm older, the journey is the only thing that matters. Like there is no other, the end game for everyone is the same, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think people get caught up in levels and promotions and trajectories. And look, it's good to be motivated. Uh, in those categories. But at the end of the day, it's that journey. It's the experiences with people. And the thing I remember from my Nokia journey is fighting that battle with that team, it, even in the, the biggest of challenges. And I have such fond memories, such great relationships with people there, even what I would describe as the toughest business and leadership challenge I ever had. One of the things that I really captured there from what you're saying, right, on the strategy piece is really being able to recognize that strategies not more than often or sometimes do not really work out the way you would want it to, but it's important to adjust, it's important to change, and it's important to recognize that as a failure as you continue to move forward. Another thing you also talked about there is the journey, right, and I want to tap into that a little bit. Uh, just in terms of you know your transition into Microsoft, and then you obviously take on all this uh, uh, senior roles and these a little bit of different roles as well. Like, did you feel like you've had to in early in your career? Did you feel like you've had to establish a platform or or do anything specific to stand out for you to be taken on to some of those senior roles? Yeah, I think you know I again I wouldn't recommend this path for everyone, but I think I was very poor at sort of planning my career out. <laughs> saying what platform do I need to do? How do I get exposure? And so again, maybe that's not the right, right model, but the one thing I would say that I've done consistently is how do I continuously innovate in the business I own to drive greater results? Even as a rep in Columbus, Ohio, when I started with Microsoft, at that time, the internet was just coming into play, figuring out how I could leverage that platform uh, to drive the business broader. And so I get a lot of questions about, hey, how did you think about creating a platform? What special projects did you do, et cetera? And mine's pretty simple. I'm like, if you're going to spend extra time on special projects, take all that energy and time and innovate in the business you own. And again, I don't care if you're an individual contributor as a sales rep, if you're a manager leading a team or you're an executive running a big business. At the end of the day, our jobs when we get paid for is to deliver results for the company. And so I think if everyone took all that energy, all those cycles and used it to say, how do I continuously innovate and improve in the business that I'm responsible for or the company that the company is counting on? The second philosophy I always had is, certainly there's things I get more passionate about than others, but I had a simple philosophy is, if the company said something was important to them and they asked me to do it, even if that wasn't my preferred path, I always felt like that's the path I should take because the, the company has said it's important, the company has said they want me in that role, and if I go do a great job for the company, I'll get rewarded. And, you know, uh, give me an example. When I was in the West region, running, running the West region of our enterprise business, they were going to hire the, the new leader of the U.S. enterprise business, but there was a new leader running North America, and he wasn't ready to, to put that leader in. And he asked me to come in and run sales operations for the U.S. enterprise business. And at first I'm like, I'm a sales guy. I don't want to run ops. That sounds awful. And, you know, I didn't like the ops team before. And, but I thought and said, he said, hey, this is important. I felt like, wow, if I deliver really well, and as a sales leader, I had lots of ideas on how we could change sales operations to serve the field better. And so I said, sign me up. And that turned into, then I got promoted to be CVP and run the U.S. enterprise business. But I think when the company says something's important, I always felt like sign me up, I'm gonna go do a great job. And if I do, then you know personally I'll be rewarded from that. But it always started with what's good with the company. And I think that's 
super important mindset, whether you're an IC, a manager, an executive, is saying, hey, at the end of the day, we all serve this company and corporation. And the best way to help us personally is always stay dedicated and serve that company. And so it sounds like it's really taking that, that I guess, that independence and taking that uh, that ability to be innovative and creative in your own space specifically, but then also thinking about the bigger picture, the bigger impact of the organization, the people, the customers, the partners that you represent, take that on. And that organically kind of puts you in a platform to show your executive expertise on just being promoted and being in some of those senior roles, as you've talked about, right? And so leading a large group of leaders is one thing, but being able to implement that type of thinking and philosophy and then ensuring that it's sustainable, sustainable and consistent at the same time is another thing. I'd love to get some of your thoughts around, you know, how do you create that culture for that to kind of roll out and be consistent with the leaders that you represent? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, you have to say what's the culture you're building or you want to build. And this one, I, you know, I'm a slow learner on because today I would tell you I have the best leadership team I've ever had. And it's, I changed one thing fundamentally five years ago when I started building this team. Previously, I always said, give me the most talented people in the company to be on my leadership team. Even if they didn't have great ego maturity or they broke glass, et cetera. I always felt like, hey, I could manage that. You just give me great raw talent and, and we'll, we'll be okay. That what that manifested itself. Certainly, we had I had some good performing teams, but it was never a unified team. And I would say, we I always had someone or some people who were more divisive. So in team meetings, doing the good for the company, etc., it was never totally integrated and working well. So when I built this team, the fundamental thing I said is no egos. That was what I was going to optimize for. Certainly, I want super talented people. But if they weren't great at communication, collaboration, team play, company minded, they weren't going to be on my leadership team. That was a massive change for me. And today I would tell you, it's not only helped us build a culture that's attracting and retaining talent and delivering great business results, but it makes my job so much more enjoyable because everyone's rowing in the same direction. People are willing to sacrifice for the good of the business or the good of the cause. And I tell you, it just creates an energy and environment that I would encourage everyone as they're building out the team is to say, what's the culture of the, your leadership team you want and how does that resonate all the way down? Then the second thing that really I stumbled upon in the COVID timeframe is this whole thing around well-being and self-care and we can talk more about it. Uh, but I've been one that's always sort of separated the business from the personal side. And I think the epiphany I've had really over the last 18 months is the more I invest in my own well-being and self-care, however you define that, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, um, the more I do that, the better self I bring to work. And if I bring a better self to work, I serve my people better, I serve the business better, I serve our, our customers and partners better. And so I'm a massive believer in this well-being and self-care as the secret sauce for long-term sustained business performance, not as some interesting cliche to say, hey, we're focused on self-care and well-being. Like I'm experiencing it myself. The more I carve out time for myself to invest in myself, the better I think I am as a leader in the business. And so that's a culture we're building that I think is catching on. There's a huge need for it. And I think it's allowing us to both attract new talent and regret the, uh, retain the great talent we have. I want to talk about self-care and well-being a little bit, right? Because I've had the opportunity to really see you execute that, see you live that, and see you really represent that specific uh, component. And, and I've seen how important that is to you. And so I, I have to ask, well, a couple of questions. My first question is, is that obviously uh, an executive at your level, you're responsible for a really large business, right? Not to talk about the number or anything like that, but does it ever cross your mind uh, or does it ever concern you at any point in time that the, you might, the, might, the number might be impacted by the amount of focus that there is on self-care well-being versus the actual business? That's my first question. Now, my second question I'd love to know is, is how do you specifically prioritize self-care and well-being for yourself 
considering the responsibility that you have? Yeah. So the first question I would say historically for most of my career, I would have always thought, wow, investing in self-care or well-being, like that's going to cost me at work or cost the business, what have you. And I always just thought those things were separate. And, you know, quite frankly, the culture I grew up in was more, 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 meaning more meetings, more work, more emails, more tasks, more projects. And, you know, I've had to rewire myself completely that says less is more. Because at the end of the day, you know, if I'm sitting in 12 meetings during the, the day, I can promise you those last couple meetings, I'm not real effective in there, <laughs> right? I'm probably not thinking straight. I don't have clarity of decision making. I know I get irritable at the end of the day when I'm tired, et cetera. And so just even from an inspirational perspective. So my view is this thing about the more we invest in self-care, I don't look at all that it's going to negatively impact our business. I'm of the mindset. And again, I'm trying to live it every day. It will positively impact the business. I see it with myself where I now build breaks in between meetings. So now I can get a little bit of energy and recharge so I have clarity of thought going in versus just meeting after meeting there. And so I feel it for myself, I see it for myself. And so even though I do less meetings, I do less email uh, because I'm trying to get more balance, I believe the things I participate in, I'm delivering more value. And so I think these things are so interrelated but just like myself, I think everyone's got to rewire themselves because that's not what we've been taught in the corporate world. And so I feel like I've stumbled into this, you know, the, the keys to the, the kingdom on long term sustainable business performance is what no one thinks. It's really investing in our own well-being and self-care. Now, that doesn't mean, hey, every day is just hunky dory and I'm living in this Zen state constantly. That doesn't happen. I mean, business is messy. Hard work is still required, long hours is still required, but I think just keeping top of mind and making sure that balance is there and then carving out that time and space for yourself. And for me, it's the morning time. I have to work out in the morning. I'm starting to meditate. So, you know, I've asked my assistant to carve out time early in the morning. We try to do 6 to 8 a.m. where I can control my calendar is keep that time free for me to work out, to meditate, to get some food, et cetera. And I find if I can do that and then at the end of the day, I carve out time just to sort of decompress, get prepared for the next day. Those two things are so critical for me. Uh, for my own well-being and, and, and mental well-being. I feel like, you know, telling that story in a few years from now, you're going to really look back and be extremely proud of this moment, proud of the fact that you've determined that productivity would really be exercised and enhanced just by prioritizing self-care and well-being, right? And just in the spirit of pride, like if, if you look back at your leadership journey outside the self be, uh, self-care and well-being prioritization, what is the one thing that you'd highlight that you're the most proud of in your leadership journey? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't know if there's like one thing and, you know, I hope it's still <laughs> too early to just look back and reflect. I still feel like I got a lot of energy and, and value to add. I mean, the thing I always say is like, I wanna be known as authentic leader, like a real leader um, who served the business every day. Um, I think it's super important. I grew up, my dad owned a small business and, you know, he constantly, you know, talked about a number of different things. One is he said, you don't get paid for dealing with the easy problems or easy people, you know. And so I think about that a lot because, you know, the pressure I feel on a day to day basis is immense at times. But I look at it and say it's also a privilege. And so I look at that instead of being a victim uh, to those things, I look at it as, wow, what a gift and what an opportunity. And that's why I get paid to, to do what I do. And so, you know, he always used to say, by the way, he said, you could go to the zoo and hire monkeys um, if the jobs were easy. Um, but at the end of the day, I really would say um, being authentic and then serving the company every day with that company minded attitude is the thing I'd want to, to be known for. I'm super curious. You talked about your dad, they're owning a small business, right? And I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of learnings that would have come from that. And so if, if you don't mind, if you're okay with it, you know, you talked a lot about differentiation from just being innovative, being in your own lane, and then just being creative with what you have, but then also thinking about bigger picture in terms of the, the greater goal of organizations, customers, partners, people, et cetera, right? How much do you feel like 
uh, of that have you taken from observing your dad run his own business? Mm, I, everything. In fact, my dad passed away about a year ago, and I, I still talk about it today, which is like almost everything I learned in business was from him. On the leadership side, like he was the guy who, you know, gave us inspirational statements every morning, would print these things out. Um, but, you know, just even through osmosis, it's not like he sat me down and talked about cash flow of a, a business, but Thanks. you learn those things and you learn how difficult a successful business is to run. And at Microsoft, sometimes I think we just lose perspective because most businesses, first of all, don't succeed. Second of all, they don't succeed with the profit margins that we have. And so even understanding what our customers and partners go through every day and how hard it is just to make payroll, to make single digit profit margins, it's super hard. And so I think having that company minded uh, mindset because I saw what, what he went through, you know, whether it was direct things he was coaching or teaching me or just through osmosis and then, you know, having to work in the business every weekend, which I was basically, you know, I had to go up and clean the office uh, every Saturday, clean the toilets, et cetera. Uh, you learn this thing called hard work. And I always say there's nothing that gets around hard work and effort. And so even as people are starting their careers, et cetera, it's not to say, hey, be so out of balance that you know you don't take care of yourself. But at the end of the day, hard work is like a good coat of paint. It covers up a lot of a lot of issues at times. And so, you know, I would tell people, you know, obviously you want to innovate, you want to be smart, you want to think strategically, et cetera. But like effort and grinding also. Uh, is an attribute that I think contributes to a lot of people being successful. It's super cool that you said that, right? Because I love how the hard work, cleaning the toilets and just uh, doing all those uh, those those gripful jobs translate into what you said earlier on, just in terms of your leadership team and how you look for no ego and just exercising humility, right? And I can actually see where that comes from as you tell that story, Chris. So it's super cool to see that moment. One last thing I'll ask you before we end, right? There's obviously a large amount of individual contributors that are not in management and leadership positions responsible for people. And obviously they're standing in line waiting to get your your opinion and your advice on what they should be thinking about to move into management positions. What do you say yeah, to them? So, yeah. Yeah, so it's an interesting one. I, I would say, first of all, you've got to ask your question, why do you want to get into management? Because I think I've seen it multiple times where people think they get into management because it gets paid more, they get more glory, higher levels. I would tell you if that's the reason you're getting into management, rethink it a lot because <laughs> that is not reality. I will tell you these people leadership roles can be the most rewarding on the planet, but they're also the hardest. And so you have to get in it for the right reason, which is you have a passion for seeing work done through other people. You have a passion for leading people. You have a passion for coaching and mentoring. You have an empathy gene, whether it's on the customer side, the partner side, employee side. And so the first thing I would say is, are you getting into management or people leadership for the right reasons? I always tell this story when I was in Dallas, Texas, running the South Central region. We created this class called, So You Want to Be a Manager. And basically what we did is we paraded a number of our managers in to anyone who was a, a day long class. And they came in and talked about the good, bad, and ugly of being a manager, right? And really just because it's like, how do you prepare people for this discipline called people management without going in and doing it? And this was the closest thing we could do. But they would talk about the difficulty where they thought they were going into to a role to lead a team and they thought they were going to be all high performers like them. And what they realized is out of a team of 10, there's two high performers, you know, six average and then two at the bottom. And the two at the bottom consume 95 percent of all their time. And they were sort of shell shocked. But there was a gentleman in there came into my office at the end of the day because he had been asking for three years. He said, I want to get into people management. Nice. At the end of that class, he came in and he said, that was the best class I've ever been in. And I said, why do you say that? He said, it just told me I never want to get into people management. I love my individual contributor role. And so my point on it is not to say, hey, get dissuaded from it, because it's one of the most rewarding you know, professions and careers. But you have to get in it for the right reason, which is 
you like to lead people, you have a passion for people, you like to see work being done uh, through people, and you have this mindset of this inverted org that says, those people are not working for you. As a leader, you're working for them, and your job is to make sure you're removing barriers for them to be successful. If that's the sort of philosophy you have, the mindset, you'll be an amazing uh, people manager, and I tell you it's the greatest, greatest profession and career you could be in. And that's how you have fun, right? And that's how it makes everything else secondary, right? And that's how you have the most enjoyable time. Chris, what a great place to leave it. You know, thank you so much for taking the time, for sharing your journey, for sharing your leadership principles, philosophies, and also learnings along the way. I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you did too. Thank you so hey, much. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to doing it again. Yeah.